Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to the Feel Good Factor. I'm Susmita Viganasaurus and I'm so glad you could join me here today. Hi, sweet people. I hope you're all having a fabulous week. Our guest today is a very inspiring person, Kuntal Joysha from Mumbai. Kuntal is the first vegan to have climbed Mount Everest and he's done it twice. This episode is part one of a two-part series. In today's conversation, we get to know all about Kuntal's backstory and inspiration, the twists and turns in his life that unexpectedly led him on his journey to becoming a passionate mountaineer. Kuntal is an incredible storyteller. This is the third time I've interviewed him. The first two times were for the Carrots Restaurant YouTube channel. Each time I listen to him talk, I can picture his experiences with so much clarity and detail. My favorite part is when he talks about seeing Everest in the sunset for the first time. The way he describes that moment, I can almost hear uplifting orchestra music playing in the background. <laughs> Today's conversation stops short of Kuntal's actual arrival at the summit of Mount Everest. And there's already so much to be inspired by. My hope is that between this episode and the next, Kuntal's story motivates you to follow your dreams and see the value in making them come true no matter what. Hi Kuntal. Hello Shushmita, how are you? Good, good. How are you doing? Good, 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 good. So I just wanted to sort of uh, give the listeners a uh, clarification. I'm constantly introduced as the first vegan in the world to climb Everest. And sometimes it can get tricky, the specific label of being the first vegan. First of all, really no authorities like Nepal government or Chinese government. None of them are really keeping track of people's diets. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm just calling it diet here because a lot of people in the world look at veganism as a diet. Of course, it's not a diet, but no one is really keeping track of those. So it's really difficult to validate if I'm the first vegan. But what I did is I did a whole bunch of research. I looked at what has happened in the past. There have been a couple of people who claim that they have done as a vegan before me. And on a lot more investigation, not just by me, but by an independent magazine that put me on the cover of their magazine, we sort of figured out that either those people were vegan at sea level and not a vegan on the mountain, or they were not a vegan at sea level and they were just vegan on the mountain, which does not make the case that they climbed the mountain as a vegan, because you really have to be vegan all the time. You can't be just vegan at one place and not be a vegan on other place. That's not who a vegan is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> at the same time, I also want to clarify that I don't really care if I'm the first vegan in the world or the thousandth vegan in the world to climb Everest because climbing Everest was one of the biggest dreams of my life. And I wanted to climb it as a vegan because veganism is a very, very big part of my life. It is part of my value system. And I did not want to compromise on my values or my ethics while achieving the biggest dream of my life. That would really not have made any sense as an overall journey. So sure, calling me the first vegan in the world, even I call myself the first vegan in the world, do that. But that is primarily so that I can get some exposure and I can get some publicity. And that publicity is primarily, again, so that I can talk about the issues that I'm passionate about, one of which is veganism. That's the only reason why I would sort of want to get the publicity. Otherwise, I'm, I really don't care if I'm the first vegan or ex-vegan or whatever. I would rather that going forward, it becomes such a norm that people are not really wowed by, hey, this guy went and climbed Everest as a vegan. Rather, people are just wowed that, hey, this guy went and climbed Everest. Like veganism becomes a norm that all people are climbing Everest as a vegan. That becomes a norm and that's not like a wow factor anymore. I, I would rather see or live in that kind of a world. I absolutely agree with you. My dream also is that the word vegan only becomes redundant. Right. <laughs> and all our identities are lost. <laughs> Those of us who are actually working towards veganism and spreading it in the world, it's like, what? what is vegan? It doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> I'm a very optimistic person, so I do know that the world is headed in that direction. 
I don't know whether it's in the near future, far future. And of course, as we have seen in today's world right now, the way we are all stuck at home or the opportunity that we have had to slow down and stay right. at home, the world is changing and it's headed in a certain direction. So I am just hoping at the other side of this, there is a lot of peace, love, compassion and a lot of that going on and the word vegan isn't even like a hype or it doesn't even have a meaning anymore. Right. I sincerely hope that happens. So Kuntal, why? Why did you want to climb Mount Everest? Can you describe the moment that idea just sprouted into your head? Because I know that sometimes we're just going through life and there are all these thoughts that keep coming to us, ideas, dreams and stuff. But when something is going to be life changing, you can just feel it in your gut. Like I felt that when I wanted to go vegan, I could just right. feel this this whole expansion of energy inside. Like it felt right and life changing. And I knew that taking the step is going to just, nothing's going to be the same again. Can you describe your moment of deciding to climb the Everest? Right. For me, mountaineering or hiking or climbing Everest, this was never part of my uh, life or I had never even thought about it in in like a very serious way forget serious i never even thought about it because uh, i come from a gujarati background and um, most of my entire family is into business that's where they are really good at and uh, growing up one of the things that i decided to do was i decided actually not to join my dad's business i was like the odd man out in my entire family in my entire extended family as as far as i could trace it in 8th standard, I wrote my first piece of software code and I really thought that coding is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I never had the business sense or never had the attitude to become an entrepreneur or do something of my own. So I always thought that I will do an engineering, maybe I'll go to the United States and do a master's and then maybe I'll just get a nice job and uh, I'll be a passionate technologist and that's what I'll do for the rest of my life. Kuntal, what about your family? Because you said you were the first person to not get into your uh, family business. So what was your family's reaction when you started showing interest in coding and engineering and a totally different line? See, I think from my immediate family uh, perspective, like my father and my mother, they were completely supportive mm -hmm. because my father has been this odd man out in the family. We had our own oil mill, like an oil refinery, and uh, he used to run the mill. And I still remember that even though his education was completely different, he ended up running an oil mill. But in the oil mill on the side, he would do these experiments like he used to be an earthworm farmer. I mean, have you ever met someone who's an earthworm farmer? I don't think I've ever met one <laughs> in my entire life, even till date other than my father that was his passion like back in the 1980s he used to grow organic vegetables when organic was not even a movement when no one even knew what is organic mm. he was growing organic vegetables he was bringing that stuff at home he was super interested in farming so he was always this odd man out and so i guess somehow it's also genetic that i also became that odd man out or maybe it's not genetic maybe just seeing him over and over again and seeing hey, my dad is doing these crazy things. Maybe I should also, you know, not be thinking about going the normal route. Maybe I should be doing something different. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I wrote my first piece of code, I was like, this is amazing. I really like that I wrote something and a machine actually did that. And it's so satisfying to create something. So I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. So from a father and mother perspective, they were pretty supportive of this my saying that I'm never going to join your business. And luckily, it was a family business. So there was my father's elder brother and, and his son. They were going to go into the business. I remember one time my father's elder brother saying to me that you should join the family business. You should consider joining. You should consider not going in this line. And I was like, not happening, man. This is what I want to do. I came to the United States. I got a job. I was enjoying my life. And unfortunately, during that time, my father got diagnosed with dementia. Mm -hmm. I had two sisters. One of my sisters was with me in the US and my other sister was becoming a doctor. And so she was also away from home, living in a hostel. So it was only my mother and my father alone at home. And every year when I would come back from the US, I would see my mother struggling to take care of my father. She was alone and I sort of realized that this is it. You know, I 
have to make a choice and i have to come back and help out or you know support my mother in taking care of my father mm. i mean they did the same when i grew when i was born they took care of me so it's now my time to uh, do the same and not in terms of duty but i just sort of really deeply cared for my parents so i thought it's time to come back anyways i have done whatever i had to do in the us i learned whatever i had to I have worked there so i have good experience so i was happy with how things had happened and i came back to india fell into the routine life i got married and and things were going great i mean i had no complaints in life there was no quarter life crisis or <laughs> or nothing like that happening i i was making good money and life was good mm-hmm. and then dipti my wife and i decided that uh, hey you know we want to take a vacation and this vacation has to be slightly different Dipti had never seen snow in her life and for me it had been almost 20 years living in Los Angeles I really did not see any snow there so both of us thought hey let's go see some snow so we end up in Shimla in the winter and uh, for the first 6 days uh, it's really cold we are really miserable <laughs> it got overcast as if it's going to snow right now and we would wait we would wait but nothing would happen and we were like really dejected by the last day of our trip when we were roaming around in the shimla market where this driver said i can take you to snow and i'm like this guy is trying to fleece us but anyway we have gotten fleeced why not you know give him some more money and get more fleeced <laughs> so we sort of uh, decided to trust that guy gave him the money and he took us to this place called narkanda which is about 80 kilometers drive from shimla over the old hindustan tibet highway and i have to tell you that the drive was spectacular so it was not like uh, we got fleeced it was worth the money but at the end of the drive we reached narkanda and we were like standing near this small dhaba in the village and we had himalaya surrounding us like 360 degree himalayan panorama and uh, it was a view right out of any super postcard in the world and it was all great we were enjoying our time but we really wanted to touch snow it was not like seeing snow would have satisfied us So you told us that you had promised that you will help us touch snow. So the driver said, "Okay, uh, there's this small peak called Hatu Peak. It's about eleven thousand feet, and there's a eight kilometer drivable road right up to the top. If that road is okay, on the top of the peak, you will definitely get a lot of snow." So we start driving towards the peak, and about half a kilometer, I think half one kilometer into the drive, we run into almost a feet of snow, and his car can't go any further because the road is just shut down. So he said, "Okay." look now you can see snow much before uh, what we had thought we would so you can go play in the snow and and we can now all go home mission accomplished and in a way the mission was accomplished but uh, sort of once we started playing in the snow and we were enjoying our time i don't know what clicked but i said dipti look we have enjoyed until now why don't we go a little further and see how things go Mm. we didn't tell our driver because then he would have like you know pushed us to get back home we just started walking about an 8 kilometer road we were doing about a couple of kilometers an hour because there was a lot of snow as we started going further and uh, we started sinking in the snow at some point we were wearing like t-shirt and jeans and chappals we were not prepared for this experience at all <laughs> you were wearing chappals in the snow <laughs> oh god we just gone as tourists so it's not like we were prepared for hike mm-hmm. but we got there and we thought that we want to do it so we said <laughs> let's push it and uh, we sort of kept going further and about i think 3 and a half 4 hours later i remember it was me dipti and like a big gigantic furry dog with us on the top i think since you asked how it started this has to be one moment that turned the direction of my life in february of 2009 hmm. not that i decided that i wanted to climb mountains on the top of that mountain but i think that feeling that feeling of being truly alive of being truly peaceful of being truly happy in that very moment i was able to experience that while i was standing or i was sitting on top of that mountain and i'm like man this is insane i have to i have to feel like this for the rest of my life if this is what i'm feeling right now why can't i feel like this all the time it would be so awesome and a lot of people say that do things in moderation that you will sometimes get bored of things but i'm not that guy if i'm feeling good why not feel good all the time what's wrong in that i was on the top and i felt really good i thought when i go back home and when i go back to work the next day maybe that same feeling will happen for my work because i'm such a passionate 
technologist and at that point in my life in february of 2009 i was building out a company and i was a director of india operations and so i thought that my work would give me the same feeling i came back home i went to work but that did not happen i was like super bored at work and i couldn't get the same feeling that i got on the top of that mountain so i said okay let me try going back to the mountains again and see if this happens so i like signed up for a, another short trip like a weekend kind of a trip a few weeks later fly out on friday night to delhi and then get into the mountains by saturday morning go hike until sunday night and then by monday night you are back at delhi and tuesday morning you join work a trip like that and when i made it to the top of that mountain i felt exactly the same way and i'm like this is it in my case i'm finding this state of mind when i get to the top of this mountain and uh, i really want to maybe you know try doing this more often and so for the next one and a half years i went on many such trips and every single time i felt amazing i said this is wow <laughs> and finally i look anyone who gets into the mountain world or gets into the hiking world gets into the trekking world will some point in their life think about everest mm. and so even i thought about it. maybe there is some background to to this whole thing because in 1997 uh, we had dd metro and dd metro used to show documentaries from time to time and there was this documentary called the PBS Nova Everest PBS is public broadcasting station in the United States and mm. they share their documentaries to be shown all across the world for free i remember PBS Nova Everest getting broadcast on DD Metro and those images of Everest and the portions of Everest the climbs by Hillary and Tenzing those it really fascinated me as a teenager and not that i understood what mountaineering was back then but the whole concept of two human beings going and climbing the tallest mountain of the world when no one had ever done it there was no route sort of fascinated me that anything is possible in this world as long as you are willing to go through the journey of training preparation and 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 getting to the top that was there but of course as a teenager i didn't understand a lot of that but those images were always in my subconscious and so eventually when i started loving mountains I started thinking about Everest and not climbing Everest but it was more like let's go see Everest I want to see the top of the world I want to see this mountain that Tenzing and Hillary climbed and so I signed up for this trip to walk to the Everest base camp mm. and this was in October of 2010 we were there we walked to Everest base camp for about 10 days it was some of the most magnificent scenery that I've seen in my entire life and since then i've done this trip almost 15 16 times like i've been to the base camp and every single time i feel exactly the same way i feel as if i'm doing it for the first time wow and it's it's incredible the kind of scenery or the kind of surreal feeling that you get when you are there amongst the giants you really like know how small we are like against nature or not against nature it's not like we are against nature but like in in middle of nature So anyway, we had reached this place called the Pumori Base Camp, which is about a couple of hours away from Everest Base Camp, and we were stationed there. We were going to be stationed there for a couple of nights. That evening, we were in our dining tents, and we were all chit-chatting. We were enjoying our time, and I know one of the Sherpas started shouting my name, so I like sort of quickly ran out, and uh, he said, "Look at Everest," and I turned around and I looked at Everest, and the last rays of sunset were falling on Everest. every other mountain around was in the color of gray blue and in the evening hues <laughs> and everest in the middle i mean i will share with you a photo but like everest in the middle imagine there are like at least 10 mountains around everest every one in blue and everest in right in the middle in like golden in color and i'm like man this mm-hmm. is insane <laughs> i mean it was almost as if like a uh, love at first sight for me when i saw everest i'm like okay Now as much as this is impossible for me to climb Everest at this point of my life I sort of promised myself that I'm going to come back one day and get to the top of this mountain and that's where sort of the dream started and of course that Sherpa was shouting my name because he wanted me to come out and take the picture of the scene because I was a team photographer so I took that picture and that picture is something where the the dream started the dream of climbing Mount Everest wow it was just by fluke by chance that i took the first trip 
went on a short journey to finally get to the base camp and finally found my dream so just grateful that i stumbled upon this dream and living a completely different life otherwise who knows where i would have been <laughs> wow it's it's a beautiful story and the way you say it of course you are a very good storyteller when you explain these things because your passion just comes through and i can picture it like i can picture it as if i was there you know the way you explain the whole thing and it sounds so so beautiful and i know that it took multiple attempts for you to actually climb right. everest right like to actually make that happen how many attempts did that take look first of all it's not like you decide that you're going to climb everest and then next day you show up and you go climb everest that's not how it works everest is at 29000 feet so to give you a sense when our flights are at cruise altitude and the temperature shows minus 50 degrees celsius that's the height everest is at and it has one third of uh, air pressure than sea level which means it has one third of oxygen saturation which means what can be done at sea level will require insane level of efforts when you are finally up there mm. so you go through this gradual process of getting your body ready getting your mind ready building the skill to become a reliable and a safe mountaineer so it's it's a long drawn process and for someone like me with no genetic gift in terms of i'm not a westerner you know people in west when they are growing up they are exposed to the outdoors they go they ski they climb mountains most of them do it and heck i had not even climbed a floor until i i went on my first trip to shimla so i used to take an elevator i was the laziest guy <laughs> i was going to go from a completely different life to a completely different one if i wanted to be successful at climbing everest so i went on the journey i built that skill i built that experience i built that physical fitness built that mental fitness eventually i ended up uh, signing up for a climbing everest in april of 2014 showed up at the base camp and um, unfortunately on april 18th uh, a huge accident happened about 17 sherpa guides died at that point which was the single largest accident uh, that happened on everest i think at some point everyone got together at the base camp and decided that the mountain was unsafe that year because a certain section of the mountain there were repeated avalanches happening and that was a section that we had to go through we could have changed our routes but doing that would have taken a tremendous amount of effort because this route has been repeated for almost 20 years so now finding a dramatically different route and then ensuring it's safe for the entire base camp that would have taken a lot of time and it would simply not have been practical so collectively everyone decided that didn't make sense so all the expeditions were cancelled on the nepal side of the mountain so first attempt was cancelled i had to come home and i told myself it's okay it's not like everyone goes and climbs everest in their first attempt and here i didn't even get to make an attempt so i'm going to train harder going to be far better prepared and go again in 2015 so then i show up in 2015 again now this time things are going a bit better we have reached the base camp we have even climbed some part of the mountain you don't climb the mountain in one shot you climb the mountain in stages so that your body gets time to acclimatize to the various altitudes on the mountain so we were doing that part by part and we had done one of the parts we had come back to the base camp base camp being at slightly lower altitude helps your body recover better uh, you can eat better if you have lost muscle you can maybe not regain the muscle but at least you can ensure that you are not losing further so it's just a place where you can uh, sort of unwind and uh, rejuvenate before making the next shot so we were at the base camp and um, we were hit by a huge earthquake a 7.9 magnitude earthquake at that point or not at that point even at this point it's been the largest earthquake to hit nepal in an entire century and we were in middle of that earthquake that earthquake ended up inducing a gigantic avalanche that hit the base camp i still remember seeing that avalanche and from the left of the sky to the right of the sky the entire sky was filled with snow and ice and debris oh. like like a gigantic tsunami coming towards us like tsunami waves are what 11 12 maybe 15 maybe 20 meters this was a wave that was the height of the entire sky and this wave was coming towards us and uh, no way to escape because everywhere where my eyes could go the wave was there so 
I think that is the moment where I sort of didn't think that I was going to die, but I was actually very certain that I was going to die. I almost said my I don't believe in God, but I almost like said my last prayers and everything like okay, I'm done. This is it. Uh, even though I don't want to die, it's not that it's in my hand at this moment. I would have loved to live further and maybe done many things. And more than fear and intense sadness had sort of overtaken me and um, I'm like, okay, I'm resigned. Anyway, in, in those circumstances, there's a fair bit of survival instinct also that kicks in. So there are three of us who sort of ran and we hid behind a tent. And in the hindsight, we always think that how would a tent have saved us anyway? Nothing could have saved us back then. But we hid behind this tent and the avalanche hit us. Luckily, the avalanche had slowed down considerably by the time it came near us and so even though it ended up destroying our entire campsite and flattening our entire campsite and our gear was thrown everywhere luckily the force of the avalanche was not so great that it could have killed us but a campsite that was about 50 feet or maybe about 70 feet ahead of us and we were separated by this small snow hill that campsite got hammered badly and five people ended up dying. So for us, it was like a narrow escape. It was a lucky escape because if our camp was just 50 feet away near that campsite, then we would not have uh, made it out alive out of this experience. <sighs> to me, it was like, wow, this is definitely a second chance to live my life. Not many get second chance in, in their life. And so I have to really, really make use of this. Every single second that I'm going to live from this point onwards is just a bonus. Because I had resigned and I was uh, ready to die. So now everything that I have is a bonus and I should just enjoy. I should sort of work hard on pursuing my dreams and passions more now. And it doesn't make sense to be wasting more time getting into trivial matters and complaining or doing those kind of things. It's just best to stay focused and pursue my dreams. So yes, a big avalanche happened. 21 people died, 100 people were injured, 10,000 people killed across Nepal, about 5 lakh people living on the streets. This time, we personally decided to cancel our expeditions because it did not make any sense to climb this mountain when a tragedy of this level had happened. But I also realized that I have a second chance and I will be able to come back and climb this mountain. At the end of the day, the mountain was not going anywhere. <laughs> the mountain has been there millions of years before us and it will be millions of years after humanity has disappeared. So it's not like it's running away. So I'm like, okay, let's go home. Let's stay focused. At the end of the day, this is my dream. This is my goal. If I don't do it, then loss is going to be in mine, not anyone else's loss. And many, like my family was like, maybe you should reconsider. So many people have died in last two years. Are you sure you want to go and climb again? But I'm like, I'm pretty sure. And my wife was like super supportive. She's like, 2016 is going to be the year. Go back again and finish this dream. We have worked so hard towards it. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to train harder, prepare myself better. I mean, in the sense, the reason I was constantly telling myself to train harder is because at some point also was thinking that maybe mountain wants me to come better prepared. And as much as I don't want to attach human characteristics to a mountain, that mountain is expecting anything of us. Mountain doesn't expect anything from us. Mountain doesn't give a shit about us. <laughs> so in that sense, it was me just trying to sort of uh, stay focused, stay positive and just have that tunnel vision that I want to climb Everest. and. Um, I trained harder. I trained harder than I had trained ever before in my entire life. And I went back in 2016 again. And that concludes part one of my interview with Kuntal Joysha. Come back next week to continue listening to his story about how he climbed Mount Everest twice, why he did it and what plans he has for his future. Meanwhile, if you'd like to get in touch with him, he's reachable on social media. Instagram, you can catch him at Kuntal J, K-U-N-T-A-L-J. And on Facebook, you can search for Kuntal Joysha, K-U-N-T-A-L-J-O-I-S-H-E-R. If you'd like to be updated about my upcoming podcast episodes and more, 
सब्सक्राइब टू माई मेलिंग लिस्ट गो टू माई वेबसाइट डब्ल्यू 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 डॉट वी ई जी ए एन ओ एस ए यू आर यू एस डॉट कॉम एंड स्क्रोल टू द बॉटम टू फाइन द सब्सक्रिप्शन फॉर्म आई एम लुकिंग फॉरवर्ड टू हैविंग यू एज अ पार्ट ऑफ द फील गुड ट्राइब इफ यू एन्जॉय दिस एपिसोड ऑफ द फील गुड फैक्टर आई वुड अप्रिशिएट अ रेटिंग रिव्यू और सब्सक्रिप्शन स्पेशली ऑन एप्पल पॉडकास्ट और पॉडचेसर डॉट कॉम यू कैन फाइंड माई पॉडकास्ट बाई गोइंग टू पी ओ डी सी एच ए एस ई आर डॉट कॉम स्लैश वीगनोसोरस एंड यू कैन लीव अ रेटिंग एंड रिव्यू नॉट जस्ट फॉर द पॉडकास्ट इट सेल्फ बट ऑल्सो फॉर योर फेवरेट एपिसोड्स Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Feel Good Factor. I'm Susmita Veganosaurus and I'm looking forward to talking to you again very soon. Bye.